Community is in a state of growth, right? Yes or no? Say yeah. Good, good following on that. Good. Okay. They're in a state of growth. Now here's the issue. The air raid siren goes off. Where do the people go? To the bomb shelter. What happened to the job? It stops. The community function stops. The cells or the people are not into the, involved with the community. They're out to save their own individual lives. And the point is this. I go down in the bomb shelter and I wait and five minutes later the all clear goes. Then what do we do? We go out of the bomb shelter, we go back to work, and it was just like an, that's called an acute response. It's just a momentary event. So there was a short, you know, it's like a coffee break. We took an extra long coffee break, right? Here's where the problem comes. This is where the issue is. We're working on the job. The air raid siren goes off. We run into the bomb shelter, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and there's no all clear. What happens then? It's, it's automatic. What happens? Stress, and what happens to your survival? How long can you live in the bomb shelter? Or how much food did you store in there? And the bottom is this. What happens when you run out of food? Then what happens? You die. Here's the issue. Your cells are in a community. They work together in a coherent group just like the community of people. The moment the air raid siren goes off in, in the body saying our survival is under threat, then the cells get into the bomb shelter. The problem is most of our stresses are, are chronic. They're there all the time. And as long as we maintain a chronic stress, then the more stress we maintain, the more cells in my body stay in the bomb shelter and don't come back out. And the relevance is the cells will die, the tissues will undergo a disorganization, and disease will ensue. And the consequence, the stress. It wasn't the genes. It wasn't the system. It was the belief that went into it. So the bottom line is stress is the ultimate problem that we face if you got here with good genes. And I said 95 out of 100 got here with good genes. And stress does this. It alters the system. The stress signals come in at the cell membrane and activate the protein pathways, which are respiration, digestion, excretion, etc. But here's the issue. If a cell encounters stress, what can it do? I already mentioned a couple of things. Well, I'll tell you what it can do. Number one, it could wall itself off, go into the bomb shelter. And the question is, yeah, I can survive, but not for a long time doing that. So that's a, a temporary effect. It's the only thing I can do temporarily. Another thing cells can do is that they can secrete things in their environment to try to make their environment happier. But that's a very expensive process because if I can't change the whole environment, I'm always just wasting energy throwing it out. It's like trying to heat Memphis in the wintertime by opening your window and leaving your heater on, figuring maybe all of Memphis is going to get warm. And the bottom line is, no, that doesn't work either. So the third thing that is, that is possible, now this is real exciting stuff. The third thing that is possible is you can adapt. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means change your genes or change your biology to respond to the stress. Well, what is adaption in biology today? There is no adaption in biology. Why? Because we undergo a belief system called Darwinian evolution that says what? that the changes in the genes, the first premise is all gene changes are random. Why does that mean? How can I adapt if my genes change randomly? I don't know, maybe sometimes they'll adapt, maybe they won't. And the problem is this. Conventional biology has held for years and years and years the belief that when genes change, they only change by accident and randomly so that you can't ever control the outcome of a mutation. And so the consequence of that is Conventional belief then talks about, well, you know those 95 out of 100 people, that, let's say the, in cancer, in breast cancer, for example, again, 5% of women have a, a hereditary linkage, 95% of women don't. Yet 95% of these other women who express the cancer alter the genes. So then what do we do? We go up to the chart and we say, well, the only way you can alter the genes is randomly, so it must have been just a random event. <laughs> cancer is random. Well, that's the belief system until we get rid of the assumption that Darwinian evolution is not the way that evolution really occurred. That there is another way. Well, what is that other way? It was first presented in 1988 in this paper that was published in the journal Nature. The Nature is a mainstream journal. And the journal is called, the article is called The Origin of Mutants by John Cairns, a British geneticist. And here's what he found. Listen to this because this is the, one of the most important papers in the history of biological science. Why? Here's what he did. He took bacteria that had a defective enzyme. The enzyme is called lactase. 
Lactase is an enzyme who breaks down the milk sugar called lactose. And that enzyme is necessary to break down the sugar to extract the energy in the building blocks so the bacteria can use the lactose as a food source to power its growth and division. So these bacteria that Karen starts with have defective enzymes for lactase. They cannot eat lactose. That's the truth. So he takes these bacteria and he puts them in a Petri dish and the only food he put in the Petri dish is lactose. Talk about stress. These little bacteria guys were going, oh, man, there's nothing to eat in here. <laughs> well, the problem is this. When there's nothing to eat, they can't divide. And when they can't divide, they can't reproduce the DNA, which is generally where the source of the mutations occur. And the result is they can't divide. They can't change the DNA. We expect nothing to happen. And yet, in all the Petri dishes, after a few days, there are bacterial colonies growing in every one of them. And the question was that Karen said, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> Conventional understanding says that these can't divide because there wasn't any energy, so they can't change the DNA. How did they change the DNA? So when he examined the DNA, what he found was they didn't randomly change a whole bunch of genes. They focused on the genes for lactose, the lactase enzyme, and they changed just the lactase gene, even though they weren't dividing. It was a whole new mechanism, a whole new concept. And the interesting part about it is when he reported this, the British journal Nature, they wrote an editorial right after his paper. The editors wrote, they said, look, John Cairns is a distinguished molecular geneticist. We know his work for years, but this paper we have trouble with. In fact, the title of the editorial that the British journal had was, the title was, A Unicorn in the Garden. The point is a little British humor, you know, it's like a fantasy in the Garden of Eden here, you know. The Americans, no sense of humor because a week later an editorial came out in the journal Science, which is the mainstream journal of American science, and look at the, her the, the title, A Heresy in Evolutionary Biology. What's a heresy? Well, that's for religious people. <laughs> and it said this, there's a religious belief, and the religious belief, and I say religious, is that it's underlined in there that mutations, uh, mutation is a continuous and random process. I'll read it for you because you may not be able to read it. The line underneath at the bottom, it says, Cairns demonstrated that bacteria can choose which mutations they should produce. Then the editors write, anything more heretical can hardly be imagined. <laughs> Why are they so upset? And the answer is this. Think how profound it is. If mutations can occur as a result of adapting, then mutations are not necessarily random. And if mutations are not random, then evolution wasn't an accident. We didn't get here by accident. We got here by program. The relevance of this is that we actually got here through a process of creation and evolution simultaneously occurring, that the organisms were pre-adapting to the environment and the signals in the environment were shaping the organism so that evolution was not an accident. Well, of course, conventional religious, you know, they, we went from religion, people wearing black coats, the new religion, they wear white lab coats, but it's just as much a religion as anything else. And the bottom line about that belief <laughs> is that when we question the belief, everybody, oh, what do you mean energy healing? Ah, oh, that's heresy. What do you mean changing the genes? That's heresy. The truth is, no, it's called science. But science has a conviction to hold the truth, especially as the pharmaceutical industry, again, is trying to impress upon us because they're selling us a lot of things. So the bottom line is this. What does this say? Well, this paper, uh, let me explain. The paper that Cairns' paper came out in 1988. That was over 12 years ago, okay? This paper in Scientific American is in 1997, so that was nine years after. Point about this paper. I have to read it for you because you won't be able to read it. I'm gonna, and I'm going to use my theatrical. I'm on a stage, so I'm going to read it theatrically. It says, evolution evolving. I, here's my theatrical part. New findings suggest mutation is more complicated than anyone thought. First line, nine years ago, John Cairns. And the point was, new findings nine years ago? Where have these guys been? And the answer is this. For nine years, they consistently tried to undermine Cairns' finds, findings. For nine years, they did that. When this paper was published in Scientific American, they're not saying that Cairns was right. What they're saying is this. 
They can't seem to find another explanation, but they're still looking for it. Because the idea is, it appears to be right, but it can't be right. So, but now it's a few more years down the road, and now we have another understanding. So now I'm going to show you this. And this is out of science, the journal Science. So I'm, it's not a chart that I'm making up. This is a chart out of the journal Science. This is the flow chart of information before Cairns. This is the Darwinian flow chart. How does it work? It says organisms at the top mature and they mate. They create variants. So let's say two dogs. Two dogs at the top mate. They make a litter of puppies. The puppies are all variants of, of the parents. That what happens is, we also know there's a runt at one end of the litter and there's the bulldog one at the other end of the litter, so there's a range. When the puppies have to leave the litter and they have to go out and fend for their own lives, what's going to happen to the runt? Is it going to make it? No, it's not going to be able to survive. It won't be able to compete. So what happens is nature selects the strongest one to survive and gets rid of the weakest one. That's what selection is all about, natural selection. So it says this, that the, the, those that are capable of surviving mature start to cycle over again, that all the variations arise in, in the part of the reproduction phase, which is the belief is when the DNA gets altered. Now, I'm going to show you the new flow chart based on Cairns, and it becomes very relevant for this reason. Let me first explain it before I show it to you. You see the box variants? I'm going to show you in the new chart, it's on the right-hand side, but there are three variant boxes. So it goes organisms, variant, 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 selection, and I want to talk about those first. So let's take a look at the chart. The chart is this, organism, and there are three variants, genes of DNA metabolism, genotype variation, phenotype variation selection. Let me explain what they represent. Phenotype variation. Phenotype is the physical expression as you see it. So your phenotype is how you look physically in the world. Genotype is the underlying genetic code that programs for this structure. The box on the top, there's a new name for it. So let me give you the new name because it makes much more sense. The box on the top is not called genes of DNA metabolism anymore. There's a new name. It's called genetic engineering genes. What did they find? That in every nucleus, in every cell in your body, you have genes whose function it is to rewrite the other genes if they encounter stress. So the significance is, then you're capable of rewriting your genes. But here's the most important part. What was not even included in the other chart, but is now included, and it wasn't there before? And the answer is, these two boxes right here, the environment and organism's perception of the environment. Look where the arrows go. What can the environment do? We'll follow the arrow. It goes up, across, number six and number five. What does it say it can do? The environment can cause the genetic engineering genes to rewrite your genes. Number two, they can change your genetic code. That's what it does. Now here's the important one. Organism's perception of the environment. What can it do? It can rewrite your genes, number four, or it can change your physio physiological body to respond to the environment. What's the relevance of all this? Well, the environment was never even included in conventional biology. Now the environment is found to be very important, and more so, remember the slide I showed you about perceptions and belief? I overlay the top, and look. Organism, environment, that's the slide we showed, is the environment. Organism's perception. We said perception is belief. And what does it affect? The cells. In what way? By rewriting the genes and changing the structure of the cells. The bottom line is this. Your belief in a stressful situation will rewrite your genes to accommodate the stress. And the relevance about that is that if the if a stressful environment is something that's not even real out there, you will change your biology to fit what you believe. And the issue is this, then specific organs and specific tissues of the body are connected to the beliefs. There's a great book by Louise Hay called You Can Heal Your Life. There's a glossary in the back, and she's done great research to reveal that specific stresses affect different portions of your body. And as a result, if you understand which portion of your body is affecting the stress, then you can deal with it by understanding what emotions are eliciting that stress. And I'll give you, an, you know, it's just, it's just very critical to understand this, is that the, the symptoms of your body are your, your body telling you that you're under stress. That's clear. But the point about it is your body is trying to tell you with a symptom, deal with the stress. Because if you're not dealing with it, we're going to have a problem in here. And here's the interesting point. When we go to conventional medical care, what do they do with the symptom? 
they cover it up. 